Welcome everybody to 52 Living Idea. Tonight we are covering the Analects, book 15. We'll start with chapter six. We'll have one to two readings of the text, uh, and then we'll go to Jason's translation. We'll ask that you actually keep your comments. We'll open it up for comments after Jason goes through his translation. Uh, we ask that you keep your comments to the text itself. Um, and then we can open it up for a more uh, wide-ranging discussion a little bit later on in the evening uh, after we've completed uh, uh, um, several of our uh, chapters this evening. Okay, uh, with that, would anybody like to read their version of the animal? Can read uh, Jake's leggy. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Just chapter six. Oh, six, seven, and eight. I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. Uh, chapter six. The master said, "Truly straightforward was the historiographer you. When good government prevailed in his state, he was like an arrow. When bad government prevailed, he was like an arrow." Two, a superior man indeed is Chu Po Yu. When good government prevails in his state, he is to be found in office. When get bad government prevails, he can roll his principles up and keep them at his breast. Chapter okay. seven, the master said, when a man may be spoken with, not to speak to him is to err in reference to the man. When a man may not be spoken with, to speak to him is to err in reference to his to our words. The wise err neither in regard to their man nor to their words. Chapter eight. The master said, the determined scholar and the man of virtue will not seek to live at the expense of injuring their virtue. They will even sacrifice their lives to preserve their virtue complete. Is that book 15? Uh, Is that? I, uh, I, 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 I don't know. This is book 15 want, here. Is that the wrong thing? <laughs> it sounds book, like book, it wrong yeah, it's a, it's a very... Um, Different version, uh, and then one. Uh, that I, you know, is, is that the? Are, are you reading the chapter of uh, book fifteen? Book fifteen, chapter yeah. six. Yeah. 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 She she finished with fifteen point nine and not fifteen point eight. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. So, <laughs> was it the wrong chapter? No. 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 Uh, you just to read no, the one just, more. Just, yeah. Exactly. Um, I was just. I was no, just looking at the leggy version. Voice organized at the same. No, 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 no. Yeah, Penny is reading the leggy version, and what I was just looking up was the leggy version, and it appears he consolidates a couple of verses, which is why her nine, her eight was R nine. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes. So sense. should we? So should we go through to nine then? Um. Oh. Um, no, that that's through to do eight because the nine okay. and the ten I tend to put together because they're both talking about Ren, and that works. Six, seven, eight, uh, three of these talking about the language, how you speak. Okay. Um, would anybody else like to read their version of the analytics? I can read the you know? That'd be wonderful. Okay, so 15.6. Zhu Chang asked about effective action. The master said, if your words are loyal and trustworthy and your conduct sincere and respectful, though you be in distant barbarian state, you won't be effective. If your words are not loyal and trustworthy and your conduct not sincere and respectful, though you be in your own neighborhood or district, can you be effective? When you stand, let these thoughts appear before you. 
when you ride in your carriage, let them appear, leaning on the carriage bar beside you. Zhu Chang inscribed those words on his sash. 15.7, the master said, how strange Shu Yu is. When the Tao prevails in the state, he's like an arrow. When the Tao does not prevail, he is like an arrow. A Jun Zi, with Chu Pa Yu, when the Tao prevails in the state, he serves. When the Tao does not prevail, he can roll it into a ball and hide it by his heart. 15.8, the master said, to fail to speak with someone whom it is worldwide to speak with is to waste that person. To speak with someone whom it is not worthwhile to speak with is to waste the words. The wise man waits neither people nor words. Thank you, Quan. Oh, sorry. I'll let you share it, Jason, but I'll read from my copy. Okay, uh, let me turn on. Hey, how come it's always the wrong version? Unless you need me to share it. Just let me try one more time. Okay. Do you see the... There we go. Okay. We can see it. Six. All right. Yeah. Now, let me get to mine. There we go. 15, verse 6. Zijong asked about behavior. The master said, If you speak sincerely are trustworthy, and behave honestly and respectfully, you can travel through distant barbarian states. If you don't speak sincerely, nor are trustworthy, nor behave honestly or respectfully, can you even travel in your own country and neighborhood? When you stand, let these words appear before you. When you are in your carriage, let these words lean on the front bar. Then you can start to travel. Sujang, so wrote these words down on his sash. 15.7, <clears throat> the master said, how straight the historian Yu, when the state was in Tao, he was straight like an arrow. When the state was not in Tao, he was straight like an arrow. What a Junzi Xu Bo Yu is. When the state was in Tao, he worked for the government. When the state was not in Tao, he could collect all his knowledge and hide it. 15.8, the master said, if you don't speak with those whom you should speak with, you lose the people. If you speak with whom you shouldn't speak with, you lose your words. The wise neither lose people nor words. Thank you, Amang. Um, so I think these three uh, si uh, chapter six, seven, and eight are all related to language or behavior. So uh, let's start from chapter uh, six. First, uh, uh, Zhang, as we know, okay, so here is a poem here. Uh, Zhang Wen Xing, okay, this word, Chinese word, let me enlarge a little bit, okay. The word Chinese, in Chinese called Xing, this same word have a double meaning. Uh, first means behavior, okay? Also means travel, walking, okay? Walking through travel, okay? So I think this take advantage of the Chinese word xing has a double meaning. So Zhi Zhang asked about xing, okay? Here he meant, of course, he meant the moral meaning of travel. That means his behavior. So the master said, Okay, 14, right? Sincerity, okay, and uh, uh, trustworthy, 
I think some translation will like translate as loyal, and I will prefer translate translate as sincere, sincere. Okay, and then uh, behave should be honestly and respectable, right? So then he said you can sing, but this word means physical sing, not morally sing, which is travel through the distant state state, even barbarian state, with the right language and the right behavior, you can travel in the distant barbarian state. But if you don't have this, even in your own neighborhood, you cannot sing, which means travel, or without the moral meaning of travel, you even cannot move in your neighborhood. I think that's a Confucius answer. So it's a very important teaching in Confucian morality. And another import, important thing is Confucius said, when, uh, uh, okay, when you stand, you should see this word in front of you. Okay, when you stand, it means you are going to walk, right? When you get on your car, your carriage, you should see on your driver's seat, right? In your uh, 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 driving wheel, okay? On your front bar. So you always see it. So Confucius means you should always remember these words, okay? Sincerity, trustworthiness, yeah. honest, yeah. respect. Uh, uh, the respect of, respect of for, okay? All these uh, uh, things in front of you, doesn't matter you are walking, or you are driving. So Zhi Zhang as a very young uh, junior student take Confucius advice literally. So he wrote it down on his sash. Okay? So he can always see this word. Okay? I believe if not Zhi Zhang instead of Zhi Lu, he probably will not write it down. Because, uh, okay, so that's six. Seven, a little bit different in the translation. <clears throat> Uh, here he talk about a guy called Si Yu. Okay. Uh, si Yu. Okay. So uh, the person's name is Yu. Okay. And uh, then his job is Xi, which is a historian, uh, official re record, okay, the uh, official job. So I think here Confucius means uh, this guy, uh, Si Yu, compared with another person. Qu Bo Yu, okay. Remember, we talk about Qu Bo Yu is Confucius' uh, old friend. So here he talk about, uh, I think both Yu and the Qu Bo Yu work in the state of Wei. So uh, Yu try to recommend Qu Bo Yu work for the uh, government, but the lord, the prince, uh, the ruler refused. So on Su Yu's dying bed, death bed, he kind of asked his son not bury him. You now use this method to uh, make sure the ruler listened to him. So the dead lesson here is uh, Confucius said, Yu, okay, the historian Yu is straight. We can take metaphor straight. You are straightforward. Okay? Doesn't matter the state is in Tao or not in Tao. Okay? Or mean in in order or not in order, he always act the same way. Then he talk about his friend. It's a Jun's when the state is in Tao, he work for the state. When the state is not in Tao, uh, Confucius used the word Juan er Huai Zi. Okay, and I think Eno's translation says roll up like a ball and go away. And I think uh, I, I have a different interpretation. I believe here means you collect everything and uh, uh, leave. Okay, so I will assume uh, collect your belongings. I believe probably means collect what you have learned, collect what your knowledge and hide it. Why means hold it, means hold the thing you have and leave. leave. So uh, that's metaphorically and really depend how you're going to uh, interpret. Uh, chapter eight, 
uh, the mask, this one again talk about language, right? And this one is a, a wise language, a, a, a good advice for everybody, even today, right? So you will face the situation, right? Uh, some people uh, will lose, pe lose people or lose world, right? So if you don't speak, with those who you should speak with, right? That means the righteous person. You lose these people. You should talk to the right people, virtuous people. If you didn't talk to these people, you lose these people. Some people, let's say, it's evil people or so-called small men, uh, never talk about virtuous or meaningful thing, always in to the small chat. Okay. Uh, 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 if you spend time to talk to these people, you lose the man, the, 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 the world. The means you lose waste your world. So two situations, right? You only speak to the right person, the good person, the virtuous person. If you don't, you lose the people. And you don't speak with people you should not speak with. Okay. If you did so, that means you waste your work. So that's uh, Confucius teaching here. So uh, Amang, I'll put it to you. Yeah, thank you, Jason. I dropped Qing into the chat um, with the etymology because I do think that it's kind of the, it's the pivot of these three verses and the crux of the argument that Confucius is putting forward here about the power and um, utility of words, of choosing the right words, whom you speak with, when to speak them, where to speak them. I was just reading back over it, and I know I wasn't here last week, but I, I have to once again point out the very previous chapter when he talked about the before this 15.5, that the sage king Shun was the only one who could govern with Wu Wei. That is a direct argument of why the Taoist idea of Wu Wei is not utilizable. It's not useful for normal people to use in governance. In the same way, this argument about the power of words is an extension of his philosophy of what governance needs to be. To move in the world in an effective way, you need the right words spoken to the right people at the right time. You need to actually be measured and thoughtful about what it is you say. That is the centrality of these three verses. When he's talking to Zhejiang, he really is saying that if you've got it down, if you're a wordsmith and you're speaking your mind clearly and effectively, then even those for whom eloquence isn't appreciated are going to respect you, are going to allow you to have sort of a carte blanche of their terrain, as it were. Not that you couldn't literally be understood that you would be unintelligible, but barbarian lands implies that this is a place where the written word scholarship knowledge is not well prized and therefore if you're coming across as too uppity or too snooty, you probably aren't going to get very far. But if you're really good, if you really know how to craft your thoughts into the proper words for the proper place, a situation like that's going to present no problem to you because you're not going to come across as if you're putting on airs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in the same way, when he talks about Chibu Yu, he's talking about how he followed his path correctly. He, he was on the straight and narrow. He absolutely knew which way to navigate and move through the world, whether the world around him was on his side or in utter chaos and tumult. He still had a straight way to go. And when it was in utter chaos and tumult, he took his knowledge, his words, because that's how you record your knowledge is in the written word. And you roll them up and you hide them close to your chest so you don't share those with unworthy people. And then again, in chapter eight, it kind of brings the whole argument home. 
if you speak to whom you should, or excuse me, if you don't speak to whom you should, you'll lose people. That's pretty easy for, I think, most of us to wrap our head around. If I don't, you know, take the time to pay attention to the student I need to speak to, then that student is just forfeited. I'm, I'm forfeiting their attention. However, if I take too much time to speak with people whom I shouldn't, in other words, if I'm just in my personal example, I'm talking with kids I find fascinating on campus, but they're not in my class and they're going to graduate. My words are going to flit out in one ear, out the other, and it won't have the same impact as speaking to whom you should, and it will waste my words. And the wise neither waste people nor words. And so you do these things in the right way at the right time. That's really what I think is at the heart of these three passages. Thank you, Mon. Uh, so now we will open it up for comments. If anybody has comments on any of these passages, uh, go right ahead and we can actually uh, get started. Um, Juan, Nick is next. Uh, I would say that those three paragraphs are very interesting because one again, once again, uh, it's about uh, it's about uh, the interaction between uh, the upper trigram and the lower trigram, because in the three cases. Uh, wisdom is extolled, but at the same time, each of the three paragraphs stress the fact that you need to be street smart or street wise at the same time in your interaction with others. And uh, I take the example that Amon just gave for if you're in barbarian lands, meaning that if you're in lands not having the same symbols and the same... Uh, historical or cultural traditions, it would be a, a bit a loss of time or even counterproductive if you explain your stuff using your cultural background. Uh, it could be very counterproductive. So uh, it is being streetwise and not to use precisely your cultural background explaining universal things. Same for the guy who is an arrow, uh, he's the same. Okay, either when the Tao is prevailing in the state or when the Tao is not prevailing in the state. So here, that paragraph underlines the unwavering presence of the upper trigram precisely. In the sense that, once again, and here, anyway, I'm speaking to people who knows those things, so I would not hesitate to use the symbology of Confucianism. The guy who is straight as an arrow is the same in the sense that he is unwaveringly in the upper trigram, independently of the situation in the lower trigram, okay? A state uh, in the Tao, a state uh, not in the Tao. And uh, finally, uh, maybe a last word on the inseparability of uh, knowledge and action. And I would say that those three paragraphs also are addressing that uh, principle, that uh, the inseparability of knowledge and virtue at the first level, and the inseparability of uh, knowledge and action. And I stop here. Thank you, Kwan. Uh, Nick. Uh, just want to make a comment on the last verse, verse 8. Uh, this may be uh, reading him from the modern perspective, um, but I see an uh, see, uh, echo of Wittgenstein, which he said, uh, if you have something to say, say it. If you don't have anything to say, shut up. Right? So, but obviously... Confucius was framing this in an interpersonal context. He wasn't thinking about analytical philosophy, but but it's very, very interesting for me to see that echo. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. That is an interesting connection that, um, uh, Jason. Yeah, I think that that's that's an interesting uh, comment. And I also find uh, among the comment is interesting. He, he speak to the student uh, worthy to speak and, uh, and talk, or don't waste time to speak to the student who, if you take the utilitarian or pragmatism point of view, you know, you can read this one. But I, actually, I just, after I hear, I heard, but among that, I double read in this one. Uh, Confucius didn't say, he just said, uh, you, if you don't speak with those who you should speak with, okay? And another case is if you speak with whom you shouldn't speak with. So he just used 可以言, 不可以言, means you should, you should not. So he didn't say you should speak with the virtuous people. He, you, could, you can take a Nick point of view, Wittgenstein point of view. You know, something makes sense. You speak, you know, don't, cannot speak, don't speak. Or you can take a pragmatism point of view. Okay, I, I only speak to the person who useful, okay, and not useful. Anyway, I think that's the advice. And same thing on the, uh, chapter six, right? Uh, if you keep this kind of Confucius morality, you can travel even in the barbarian day. One thing to think about is when I 30 something years ago, I came to America, I didn't speak English or just very little English. And if based on Confucius teaching with some proper attitude, right? Proper style, I even can walk through this so-called barbarian net, which means totally different custom, totally different language, right? I can walk through with this kind of personality. And if I don't have this kind of personality, even in my own neighborhood, I have a problem. People will point at me, complain about me. I, I have a difficult to behave over there. That's another way to look at that. Thank you, Jason Amon. Yeah, <clears throat> Nick's comment about the Wittgenstein, just I had to jump in because I I agree. I do think that um, Confucius and early Wittgenstein have a lot in common about the sort of logical linkage between propositions in the world and the use of language in a practical game, as it were. Um, I think that early Wittgenstein and Confucius would have gotten along swimmingly. I think later Wittgenstein and Confucius would have clashed quite a bit because the supremacy of the spoken and written word was something that came under investigation and assault by Wittgenstein uh, in his later work. But I don't think it ever lost its place of primacy in the Confucian uh, philosophy. Thank you, Amon. Uh, we'll go to Mark next. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, I'm in the car, so sorry for any background noise. I was also going to comment on the logic of these. And it seems as if there are some kinds of inversions that take place, we might say, or analogical reasoning. If you do A, then you can do B, but if you don't do A, then you won't be able to do C, that type of thing. And I think it's, fascinating that he used those four terms which i'm hoping that someone could drop into the chat that were variously translated as uh trustworthy honesty sincerity uh, truthfulness and i think that i don't know if we want to make anything turn on the various translations of those four terms but it would be interesting at least to know what 
what four terms are being contrasted here. And, and what I was wondering about those, is he pointing to something universal, saying, yes, as Aman said, you might go into these barbarian cultures, they're not literate, but uh, literacy may not be a necessary condition for humanity in this sense. If all of these four ethical traits, we might want to call them, are recognized potentially among barbarians, does that imply that they somehow have a universality to them? Thanks. Does it, but does um, does the written word have uh, is it that required for ritual in a sense? Can I tackle that real quick? The yeah. short answer, no. Um, we cut down a Christmas tree, we put it up. You don't need a written word for that holiday ritual to perpetuate itself. But to explain it, to understand it, and as ritual becomes more complex, the more you can capture in writing, the more faithfully you can execute it. And I did drop those four terms uh, Mark was asking for into the chat. I have to go back through and pull out the Chinese, but um, it's sincerely trustworthy, honesty, and respectful. And by written word, I also meant literate, but thank you, Amon. So yes, yeah, and commenting on Mark's. Oh, go ahead, uh, Jason. Yeah, yeah, same, same quick. I, 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 I will specifically say this one is this verse, I think chapter six, is nothing to do with rituals. Okay, because ritual is uh, highly tied to your culture, your background. So if you you don't here is beyond the virtue uh, beyond the rituals, right? You go to the barbarian land, or let's use the word a more civilized word, the foreign land, right? They definitely have a different rituals. Okay, some people shake hands, some people hug in American. Okay, so even the rituals or customs are totally different. With this full virtue, um, uh, think among uh. I drop here since sincere, uh, trustworthy. This is related to your word, okay. Honest and respectful. That's related to your behavior, your action. So with this virtue, you don't need ritual, right? That's pretty sure. Uh, another thing I'd like to uh, respond to Mark is uh, I'm glad Mark. Uh, pay attention on the logic, Confucius logic, which I was working hard on translation. Logic is very important. And I do realize the later books, which are compiled by more on his later student, and I believe they have some way to sort it out. So uh, uh, I find out two things in this chapter uh, you can pay attention on this. One is Confucius like to use the way like Junzi do this way and uh, Xiao Ren, small man do this way. And uh, these two things are just object. Okay, that's the first thing he like to do. Junzi do something, small man do the object. Okay, so okay, so you one one example with Junzi do A but not B. Small man will do B, but not A, okay? In chapter eight, Confucius logic is if A, then B. If not A, then not B. So if you learn logic or uh, you know this logic is not correct, not 100 per correct. In general, it's right, but not 100 per correct. But you, you can find out that's the logic confusion. Well, I don't know if confusion really use it or not, but at least the analog, analog is writing is written in this way. So I think that's interesting to uh, pay attention. And we may see the logic is uh, not sound logic. Okay, a lot of uh, problem here, 
but compared to during this time and assume they well, they never read Aristotle, they never learn logic. I think it's very well, right? Compared to Plato, okay, at least better than Plato's right. Uh, the Western philosophy after Aristotle, the logic got much much clearer. Let's start here. Thank you, Jason. Go on. Okay, so I would like to make two comments um, concerning the question of rituals that is related to one specific culture, that is for sure. But I would like to make the hypothesis that here rituals can be interpreted in a broader perspective because I would like to remind everyone, paragraph 2.1, what is a run? A run is to conquer oneself and to return to Lee. Okay, so here we can understand ritual li as the right behavior in a certain specific situation, notwithstanding your control background. In that sense, I think that we can understand rituals perfectly as related to a certain control background. But I think that the broader understanding of culture can be the right human behavior, notwithstanding the control background. That's for one. For two, uh, concerning the, uh, the fact that rituals uh, is before theology, uh, maybe, I don't know if you guys know a little bit uh, certain anthropological discoveries, but in anthropology, it is a well-known stuff that rituals always precede uh, theology or systematic uh, explanation of cosmogony, okay? And I give two examples. Uh, the Indian perform uh, the sacrificial rituals as prescribed in the Rig Veda for centuries before explaining in the Upanishad uh, the cosmogony and the psychology and the epistemology related to those rituals. The same for the Chinese under the Shangjing dynasty, they perform a lot of sacrifices and of sacrificial rituals but they had to wait at the end of the Shang Yin dynasty at the beginning of the Zhou dynasty to have some epistemological explanation and some cosmogony and religious theology related to those rituals. I give those two examples because we're in a Chinese group, but I could have given explanation related to the Greeks or to the Romans, for example. I stop here. Thank you, Kwan. And Penny or Brian. Yes, I just wanted to briefly from Mark's question, because since my verses were numbered differently in Leggy, I just wanted to say what he said, hit the words he used for the behavior. He said, the master said, let his words be sincere and truthful and his actions honorable and careful. So sincere, which is exactly the same, instead of trustworthy, he said truthful. And his actions honorable, which you said honest and careful instead of respectful. So I think they're, they're very similar ideas that he was conveying though. If you're sincere and truthful and your actions are honorable and careful. So since Mark had mentioned what maybe what other translations were, I just wanted to say what Leggy had translated, those four key behaviors. Yeah, I think that actually that's interesting because when I, when I heard that each translation, the thing that first had come to mind at a higher level was the importance of authenticity and character within that particular actually uh, passage itself. So, and I think that that was captured actually in Jason's translation as well as the Leggy translation. So, um, let, let me ask one quick uh, question here, uh, basic English question here. So, does the English word, because the Chinese words here <clears throat> use jing, okay, and then in general, I will translate as respectful. Does, but the, I think Chinese respectful has implied some meaning of helpful, cautious, this kind of meaning. I don't know, does English respectful has 
connotation of cautious, careful? Dundee. That, that's my question. I Mark, okay, Mark, Mark, you'll have I'll to. Go. Mark, go ahead and respond, Juan. Uh, you know. oh, I, someone can go ahead and answer Jason's question. I have a, a related question for Penny and the others. Thanks, Penny. Uh, I was wondering if it did imply some sort of idea of universality, that these things would be recognized among all cultures, barbarians included. Yeah, I think it does actually imply universality. I mean, that's my my thought. Um, that yeah, these are things that are universally appreciated. Uh, so, Quan, go ahead if to answer Jason's question. Yeah, it's about the word respect. Okay, and here I have the occasion to be a little bit pedantic. As sometimes I'm a little bit pedantic. Respect in English comes from Latin res spectaculare, okay? And res spectaculare means to look again, okay? So to look again imply admiration, but also imply to be careful. So I would hypothesize that respect in English has the same richness of meaning than in Chinese. I just want to echo Quan here. I agree with him, which is why I thought respectful was a good translation of Jing. Um, revere or venerate could also be kind of versions of Jing that might hold the connotation of a little bit more caution or care, but I thought respectful was more universalizable than venerate or revere because those tend to have almost divine or religious connotations associated with them yeah thank you thank you uh, both of you i think that's a great uh, explanation yeah so same thing as the words trustworthy and the deity translate as choose right truthfulness right so See yeah. how you can brought attention to all the words and all the different translations of them. Yes. That we can be talking about this now. Yeah, we talk about the, the, the trustworthy and the Nike translates as a truthfulness or something truth. So uh I think the relation the Chinese word is xin. Okay. So that's the way we suppose to speak. So that means your word is trustworthy. Uh, why your words is trustworthy? Because you speak truth. I think that's the, and the truth is not metaphysical truth, but here it's truth is honest, you don't lie. I think that's a uh, relation between trustworthy and uh, uh, truthfulness. Yeah. Yeah, Nick, and then we'll move on to the next. Um, yeah, uh, maybe just come and just make one comment on the Mark's question about universality. Um, it's clear that Confucius always uh, presented his uh, theory as universal truth. However, uh, at his time, the notion of universality is rather rather special, rather limited in the sense that. Uh, you know, people thought that the end of the world is the when you reach the edge of the ocean, you know, the seashore uh, for Chinese, I guess. Uh, um, so Taoism might have a uh, more reflective notion about universality, but for the Confucius, uh, it's rather limited, and uh, and there is a the sense of uh, of the the thinking being solipsistic in a sense that uh, you know, everything happens in the middle kingdom, maybe on the edge of some barbarians. <laughs> so there was a very limited notion of uh, existence of multiple civilizations uh, out there. And that would uh, 
will come up come to the same understanding of certain universal truths. So, 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 so the notion of universal truth is is different from the our our understanding today. I would say, yeah. So how how did explain that? How did the limited understanding uh, meaning impact the value and virtue of truth? Uh, in a sense, uh, it's um, it's solipsistic instead of uh, multi. So other word diverse diversity of opinions, right? So it. Okay, I mean, I, I can I can see that, but it's still the idea of honor and truth. That that's what I was trying to reconcile because what would be true, you still want to be honest. I mean, that's still the same value. I, 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 yes, I guess the limited perspectives on the world as to what is true, I, I guess that would be limiting. Um, but truth in and of itself would still be a value. Anyway, uh, Quan. Uh, I would like to tack, uh, to address that question of universality. Uh, I, I think that it would be a bit far fetched to introduce the notion of diversity with that within Confucianism. I explain myself. Confucianism is a philosophy having universal pretensions. Okay, I stress pretensions. Let's not forget that at the time, as all culture, civilization having a certain overbearing pretensions and looking down on the barbarians. And I would like to mention that the Greeks have the same attitude. The value of what is universal is defined by the people having the pretension to be universal and looking down on the people they call barbarians because they don't grant them the same level of civilizational development. Were they right to, to have that attitude? That is debatable. But in their mind, the production of their civilization is universal and the other people they look down upon have to evolve to their level. Okay, once again, that overbearing attitude is debatable, but that is what they thought, okay? Same for the Greeks. And within that uh, civilization, there is a group that they consider being evolved enough to have the privilege to talk about those things, okay? The aristocrats, the scholar, same for the Greeks. I'm not saying, I'm not promoting uh, overbearing attitudes or looking down on people. I'm only stating a very historical fact that they were conscious, had, having had the confidence, the self-confidence to think that they were at the center of the world and that their aristocracy has been endowed by God or by what you want to define what is high, what is good, what is beauty, what is goodness, what is truth. So in that sense, what they define as universal is truly universal for the people they think having their control and epistemological achievement. I stop here. Thank you, Juan. Uh, so shall we move on to the next? Yeah, let's read the uh, nine and the ten, which is about Ren. Um, I don't know if Penny's there, but if she wants to read, but I can go ahead and read. Uh, the master said, the determined scholar and the man of virtue will not seek to live at the expense of injuring their virtue. They will even sacrifice their lives to preserve their virtue complete. Number 10, Zigong asked about the practice of virtue. The master said, making do his work well must first sharpen his tools. When you are living in any state, take service with the most worthy among its great officers and make friends of the most virtuous among its scholars. Uh, 
would you like to read the inner version, um, Quan? Would you mind? Uh... No, so, mm, sorry, I'm, I'm a little ways. Like, oh, I'm sorry. I Sorry, I, I would yeah. finish my candy. It wouldn't take two seconds. Okay, I'm ready now. <laughs> okay, 15.9. The master said, the gentleman who is resolute and a run does not seek to live on at the expense of a run. And there are times when he would sacrifice his life to complete a run. 15.10, Zhu Kong asked about Ran. The master said, the craftsman who wishes to do his work well must first sharpen his tools. When you dwell in a state, serve those of its grandees who are worthy men. Befriend those who of its gentlemen who are Ran. Okay, Jason. All right. Verse nine. The master said, resolute learned people and Ren people won't suffer to live if it hurts Ren. They would rather sacrifice themselves in order to achieve Ren. Verse 10. Zugong asked about the action of Ren. The master said, a Craftsman needs to sharpen his tool if he wishes to do a good job. When you dwell in this state, serve the ministers who are worthy, befriend the learned people who have the quality of Ren. Thank you, Amam. Okay, so uh, these two are simple and they, uh, but both are very important <clears throat> because it has constantly been quoted uh, in the Chinese uh, conversation. Uh, that's why I like to separate these two, and they all related to Ren. So first, uh, the chapter nine talking about zhi shi ren ren, okay, which means shi means learned people, resolute learned people, and ren people. I, uh, I think here we, sh I think the English translation sounds like two people, but uh, actually we it means one kind of people. Okay, the person as a si and also as a ren people, okay, will suffer to live if it hurts them, and they will rather sacrifice themselves in order to achieve ren. So here the message is ren is more important than your life. So for next two thousand years, whoever the martyr himself uh, sacrifice his life will. Chinese words will use the word achieve run. When somebody said achieve run, use usually means he died. Okay, so don't use this word casually. So uh chapter 10, Zi Gong asked about run. Okay, and the Confucius is the answer. Okay, uh this time Zi Gong is not asked about run, a single word, right? He asked about Wei Zen. That means action of run. Okay, so be more specific. So Confucius' answer is very interesting. He starts with a craftsman needs to sharpen his tool if he wishes to do a good job. Okay, this one also become a very common saying on that in the Chinese language. So if back, if we look at back on chapter eight, okay. Uh, you only speak to the person you should speak. You don't waste your words to speak with the person you don't need to speak with. So if we take Confucius' uh, point of view as a uh, instrumentalist point of view, and we see everything as a tool, here Confucius is instrumentalist, right? So he think about if you want to do a good job, you have sharpened your tools. So why you, when you want to be run, you need to find the run or worthy people, be friend with them. So in a way he use friend as means to achieve your run. Okay, let's put this way. And, or you can say, 
find the friends to achieve your own virtue. So uh, that's what I need to say. Uh, Amar, please. I think we're going to have some real time editorial just dis editing discussion because something you said just thunderstruck me about verse 15 9 that phrase jishiren i have read that everywhere everyone who ever translates it puts that and in there resolute learned people and ren people but it, your supposition is that this is discussing one type of person and therefore, I think there's a different rhetorical way this would sound in English. It would it would be communicated as something like resolute learned people, ren people won't suffer, blah, 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 blah. So there's, with a comma, you could replace that and, and you could actually make it sound like one person. And it would be different than any other translation I've actually read that does actually refer to these as in at least implicitly as two types of individuals. However, now that you said that, and I thought about it, I agree with you. It does make sense that he's saying that the shi, who are in fact actually rent, will be the people who won't suffer this um, or won't tolerate this. This is an in. in this is incommensurate with you know living in that situation i kind of like that um and it's amazing what a just change in conjunction to comma could do uh but yeah the the sorry to get all inside baseball on everybody for a moment but this is what happens when you translate there is no <laughs> translation with yeah there's no translation without interpretation and when you interpret something just slightly different, it can be kind of revolutionary, at least in a moment's notice. And here the subject is Ren. You know, what is it that makes Ren? And when Zagong asks, the master says, someone who sharpens their tools. I mean, all the rest of it is an elaboration of that. But the thrust, the crux of it, sharpen your tools this takes me to a very literal image of japanese craftsmen or japanese um uh, carpenters who traditional japanese carpenters will spend hours of a day sharpening away at a tool it's an act of meditation so that they can make a cut with one hit so that they're not chopping and hacking and making a mess the idea being that the time spent up front makes the execution perfect and finite. You only have to do it once. And so when Zugong is asking about Ren and the master says, you need to sharpen your tools, he's talking about all that time that is put up front before you can serve well and befriend worthy people. You have to put the time into yourself because you're not just going to be liked or befriend worthy people. You're not just going to get to, you know, stumble. I have some cynicism that says, you know, stumbling your way from failure to well, failure is ever upward is the structure of bureaucracy. But that's my cynicism. Confucius dis would disagree with that. He would say you can't actually, you know, fail your way upward. You have to have done all your due diligence well in advance to ever make a, to ever have a chance at being a ren ren a, a resolute learned person a ren person yep uh, thank you amam and i i like your explanation on chapter 10 you know even we agree on this translation but when we read i probably focus on the sharpen its tool Okay, so I kind of see Confucius as uh, an uh, instrumentalist, so see everything as a tool for myself. But your explanation also it make a lot of sense to me. You talk about it's talking about the prior work you need to prepare before you do a good job, not necessarily sharpen the tool. Okay, you have to be prepared. So same as you want to Wei Ren here. Wei Ren here could be because Zigong is 
not just you and me, okay? Zigong is a government officer, okay? So when he talk about Wei Zhen, is he is doing the policy of Ren, then he has to do some preparation before he do it. So uh, that's a different uh, explanation. And I think I probably didn't do it to the daily saying about this word. Okay, a question needs to sharpen its tools if he wishes to do a good job. And actually it does in today's meaning, does means uh, instrumentalist. But uh, in Confucius time, he probably not thinking in this way. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Kwan. Okay, uh, I would have to say that um, that uh, paragraph 15.10 is interesting because it gives the methodology of the general definition of 12.1, okay? At 12.1, the general definition, what is run is precisely to conquer yourself and to return to late. Of course, to conquer yourself, we can all have an understanding of what it means. But here at 15.10, three, uh, three, three, three books later, it gives the practical methodology in the sense that a run is precisely to be perfectly humane and to be perfectly humane is to be capable to see in a given situations what are the needs of everyone present in the group and how to make those people work together for a common endeavor. And here, when you go in the state, serve those of its grandee who are worthy men and befriend those of a gentleman who are run in the sense that because you would be in interaction with those valuable people, you will practically um, put in your heart and your mind those uh, uplifting experiences so that later on, if you would be in different or lesser interactional situations, you would be capable to go back to that learning in order to be at the center, at the axis of those new situations in which you would be capable to read the needs of everyone and how to put everyone uh, harmoniously or uh, as harmoniously as possible in a common endeavor. Uh, because often uh, learning situation uh, are easier situations than uh, real life. So you have the time to build up your confidence or your or being street smart or street wise, but with easier situations so that later on when you would be in real life, you would be capable to draw on those uh, skills that you develop with the gentlemen and with the worthy people. I stop here. Thank you, Bob. Um, does anybody else have any comments about nine or 10? Uh, go ahead, Nick. Nick, uh, your human. Yeah, hi. thanks. Uh, first, Joseph, sorry, uh, which verse did we start? Did we read 11 or not? No, nine to 10. No, 10. Okay, okay. So this we on this uh, mechanical. Uh, okay, so I just want to make a point that um, this uh, this uh, phrase that I, I, translation is the mechanic who wishes to do his work well must first sharpen his tools. This has become so famous. It's become part of the the daily usage uh, when when parents or teachers uh, tell the juniors, uh, uh, you know, to go about life. Uh, that's a way to go. So it has become so so pathetic. So so, so much um, chicken soup for the soul, so to speak, drove into the Chinese culture. Yeah.
Go ahead, Mark. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to um, emphasize what Nick was just saying. This is a consummate part of the Confucian acculturation that has happened throughout most a great deal of East Asia, which is why I pointed to Japan and the carpenter sort of ritual, because it is ritual for traditional carpenters to go through hours of this meditation that is also a pragmatic action. And it is a very literal interpretation of this idea that it just it permeates all through the culture. You can find it in incidental we talked about the tea ceremony once before and that would be an example of just another uh, iteration of honing your craft before you perform it would be another way to say it you know more universalizing and so whenever somebody is learning they are in the process of honing their craft and very much in the confucian tradition so as Nick said, you send your kids off to school, your kid comes home and says, I don't want to learn math. You have to sharpen your tools before you can perform any work. You know, it, it you will hear this would be quoted at you. This would be thrown in your face as this is why you do this. So stop complaining. You have to do this first. So I don't know if it's chicken soup or, you know, the uh, soap in the mouth, but it, it works both ways. Interesting, you know, and and I'm, I just, you know, it maybe I misinterpreted it when I first read it, is that I looked at it as something as almost to develop your moral character uh, before you actually go into actually do whatever it is that you're going to do professionally. So when I read the last line and make friends of the most virtuous among its scholars, um, and uh, I, I and I, in reading the previous passage, I look at it as something as um, less uh, intellectual, meaning practical, and more uh, moral. Possibly, um, I don't but, think the two are separated in the Confucian sort of uh, framework that the intellect and the moral are you are developed in in unison one begets the other okay um does anybody else have any other comments uh number nine is uh also very interesting as the idea that we can't be harmed outside of our our own personal moral integrity so which actually relates back to honor and number six a little, a little bit. But are there any other comments? If not, we can go to the uh, next set of uh, yeah, I think chapters. Next, we have a lot of short one. Let's read 11 to 15. Um, OK. Uh, I can read or Penny or if you, I can read. Um, Yan Wan asked how the government of a country should be administered. The master said, follow the seasons of Zai. Uh, ride in the state of carriage of Yin. Wear the ceremonial cap of Zhao. Let the music be the Shao with its part uh, Pen, uh, pantomonies or pen, uh, pantomone, um, I, I mispron mispronouncing this word. Uh, banish the songs of Zhang and keep far from spe uh, specious, talk or spe spe specious talkers. Uh, the songs of Zhang are licent uh, licentious. Uh, specious, um, specious uh, talkers are dangerous. Uh, am I saying that correctly? 
I think the only one you really had a hard time with was pantomime. But yes, for the most okay. part, I think you got it. Thank you. Yeah, pantomime. Thank you. Uh, the master said, if a man take no thought uh, about what is distant, he will find sorrow near at hand. The master said, it is all over. Seeing one who loves virtue as he loves beauty. The master said, was not Zhang when, when, like one of who had stolen his situation. He knew the virtue and the talents of Hugh of Le, Le Zhu, uh, and yet did not pro procure that he should stand with, the, with him in court. Uh, number 15, the master said, he who requires much from himself and little from others will keep himself from being the object of resentment. Okay. 11.11. 11. Uh, 15.11. Yan Yuan asked about managing a state. The master said, implement the calendar of the Xia, ride the carriages of the Ying, wear the ceremonial caps of the Zhou. For music, the Shao dance. Get rid of the melodies of Zhong and keep crafty talkers at a distance. The melodies of Zheng are overwrought. Crafty talkers are dangerous. 15.12, the master said, a man who does not think far ahead will have troubles near at hand. 15.13, the master said, enough. I have yet to see a man who loves virtue as much as sex. 15.14, the master said, did not Zhang Wen Chong purloin his privilege of position? He was aware that Liu Xia Hui was worthy, but would not raise him to office beside him. 15.15, the master said, if one emphasizes enhancing one's own qualities and curtails, finding fault with others, one will keep resentment at a distance. I'll go ahead and start reading while you pull it up, Jason, just because I want to help expedite things. 1511, Yan Yuan asked about managing a state. The master said, use the proper calendar of Xia, ride in the simple carriage of Ying, wear the ceremonial cap of Zhou, perform the music of Shao dance from Sage King Shun, get rid of the melodies of Zhang, and stay away from flatterers. The melodies of Zhang are licentious. Flatterers are dangerous. 12, the master said, a man who doesn't think far ahead will have sorrows nearby. 13, the master said, it's all over. I have never seen one who loves virtue as much as he loves sex. 15.4, 1514, the master said, did Zhang Wanzhong steal the position of others? He knew that Liu Xiaohui was worthy, but didn't recommend him for the position beside him. 1515, the master said, if one demands much from himself and little from others, they will keep compliments at a distance. You're muted, Jason. Yeah, 15 is complaints, not complaints. Fifteen, fifteen. If one demands much from himself and little from others, they will keep complaints at a distance. Yeah, thank you, Amang. And I, uh, okay, I think there's a lot of short one. And chapter eleven, we need some explanation, right? Yuan Yuan asked about managing a state. Remember, Yuan Yuan 
is Confucius the best student? And he asked about managing a state, but actually he never get the official job. So he never had a chance to do it. Okay. And the Confucius answer is interesting. He quote another ancient thing, right? Using the calendar in Chinese history tradition, calendar is very important. So Xia Dynasty is has a good calendar. Wow, that's uh, so-called the Chinese uh, the lunar calendar is a Xia Dynasty. Start from Xia Dynasty, and then write in the simple carriage of in, which is simplicity. Okay, that's the second. Second dynasty, the first dynasty is Xia, the second dynasty is Yin, and the third dynasty is Zhou, which is good ceremony. So I have a calendar, simplicity, and the ceremony. So these three kind of thing. And then he talked about Shao dance from the sage king Sun, okay, which is ancient, ancient sage king. So the, everything will complete in this music, shout dance, okay. uh, so called. Uh, that's music. So here, Confucius will compare the music with language. So here, he changed the subject. He talked about the good music, which is perfect. Then he talked about zheng. Zheng is another state during Confucius' time. According to Confucius, their music is licentious. Their melody is licentious. Probably in today's view, is pop music, rapper, this kind of thing. Confucius will prefer the ancient classic music. So then he talk about perfect music, then talk about the licentious music. Then he talk about the flatter, right? The good music, bad music, then they will lead to flatter, which is dangerous language. So that's the uh, degeneration of, of the sound. Let's take this way. So that's he's talking about. Today is getting worse and worse, but let's go back to the first dynasty, heaven. The second dynasty, simplicity of living. Third dynasty, which is Zhou dynasty, the ceremonial, uh, uh, the rituals. So that's Confucius' idea of managing a state. Go back to the ancient. Chapter 12, okay, I think that's become a very common saying in today's Chinese language. A man who does not think far ahead will have a sorrow nearby, far and near. Uh, 13, I think the 13, it's a repeat uh, from chapter, uh, book 9, uh, chapter 18, but book 9 doesn't have, it's all over, so that's it. And then Nick is translated as, uh, I've never seen who love virtue as much as he loved beauties. And actually the Chinese word here is se, and I believe Confucius means sex, not means Aesthetic beauties means beautiful woman. Uh, chapter 14, uh, Zhang Wen Zhong. Okay, Zhang Zhong we mentioned in book five, book five, chapter 18, right? Uh, he is the one has her uh, raised the turtle and then, you know, and he used turtle, okay, as a foretell something is going to happen. So people think Zhang Wen Zhong is smart. That's probably 50 years before Confucius time. So uh, Confucius said he is in book five, Confucius Zhang Wen Zhong is not smart. He used turtle, something like this. And uh, this one, book 15, he further criticized Zhang Wen Zhong. He said he steal. Why, why he steal? Because he refused to recommend another worthy person, Liu Xiahui, to take the position next to him. So in this case, any governor officer should recommend a worthy person, a valuable person to the state. 
if he or he or he refuse to do so or fail to do so, it's a steal. Okay, because you steal the position. Uh, 15. The master said, if one demands much from himself and the little from others, they will keep complaints at a distance. So Confucius, I, I do the word count. This word, yuan, I generally I translate as complaints. Okay. So it's very, turn out it's a very important word in Confucius' energy. It show up 20 times. So seems like everyday life avoid stay away from complaints okay is very important uh, lesson or uh, 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 very important thing for Confucius so that I like to mention this word uh, it's shown many many times yeah uh, Ama, you have something to say please. yes and you'll have to forgive me my uh, verbal slippage there I I wanted to head Nick off at the pass here um, because he talks about some of these phrases being very hackneyed and there are absolute hackneyed phrases or just quips that are in this little series. A man who doesn't think far ahead will have sorrows nearby. Um, that That's just one example. And even the one I messed up is actually one that's pretty common. If one demands much of himself and little from others, they will can keep complaints, blame, enmity, grievances at a distance. There's a lot of ways you can translate um, the word yen, but it, I do think complaints is perfectly legitimate. Um, I did want to point out, because as I was reading this as he was talking, I want to take everybody on a very odd thought experiment with me for a moment. Please imagine with me that we're circa 1950 and Che Guevara was just elected governor of California and has decided to secede from the United States. And somebody asks Governor Che, now President Che, well, how are we going to run things? And he says, look, we're going to get this right. We're going to go back and we're going to adopt the Mayan calendar because they did it better than we did. And we're going to get all these cars out of here because they're just messing up. We're going to get some horse-drawn carriages back in action in this place. It was good for the soil. It was good for everything. We're going to stop playing this, you know, British invasion stuff that's starting to invade now. In fact, we're going to just get that ragtime jazz and, you know, classic good um, Latino sounds in into this area. And kill the marketers. They're terrible. They're evil. They're just dangerous. All the the Wall Street madmen got to go. This is kind of an equivalency between what he is telling Yan Yuan in 1511 and this little fantasy I've just concocted on the fly because what he's talking about is trying to extract that golden age and bring it back into practical action. Um, and it would be as revolutionary as those sort of examples that I just use in terms of from time to place. Going all the way back to the Shah for a calendar is ancient. That's, that's very ancient. I mean, a millennia plus for... Um, Confucius, but he sees it as the proper calendar. It, it fit better. Going back to the yin for carriages, that, that would be like cart and buggies from the 1950s. It, it would feel that desperate in time, not that it was just 50 years or you know 75 years, but it would be that monumental elite backwards. And the same thing, recapture the music of the Zhou. This was some, the, something I grew up with, something I could still hear, you know, coming up as a kid. And now we've got this ridiculous licentious music that's got people swaying their hips on the dance floor. We can't have that. Get that old time rag time music back now. And the flatterers, those who speak with flattery, it's like the market gurus of Madison Avenue, the Madison Avenue madmen, the people who know how to 
be rhetorically clever, but can, can misguide society right off the rails. I really like this passage because it absolutely captures some of the most fundamental aspects of not just Confucianism, but of Chinese culture, that tradition is the highest of value, that the highest place you can find truth is in tradition. You'll find it there. You won't find it by some sort of, um, you know, disjunctive syllogism. I was reading my symbolic logic when we were talking about it. You're not going to find it by extracting out, you know, a, a rarefied proof. You're going to find it by looking back in time and getting to the golden age when things were right. I think not all of these passages exactly address that, but I think that is worth paying real attention to because Confucius kind of gives up the entire game of Eastern etymology here. Our truth is in tradition. Tradition is the foundation of truth, much as in the West, we have essentialism as the foundation of our truth. Okay, we'll open it up for comments. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I, I, I almost, you know, work said this uh, presumption of authority from tradition is, uh, is, so heavy going into anyway. So I want to make a slightly different point on the same passage. You know, a few weeks ago we talked about the parallel with Plato, the Republic, where Plato wanted to ban poets, and here you got a a, a Confucius. You know, more or less the same time of Plato wanted to ban a certain type of music. So, so the, the, I find that interesting, you know, so the, these guys were having a very strong opinions about certain things. They saw the statecraft, therefore they want to ban. So it just... Well, I think we lost you, Nick, or either that I'm frozen. Well, why don't we go to Quan and give Nick an opportunity as soon as he is able to talk. Okay, so uh, what I want to say is that uh, it is very right that uh, in all literate culture, uh, you have uh, the notion or the concept of a golden age or of a utopia, okay, when everything was perfect and where everything was perfectly dandy. Uh, I would say that that golden age is uh, the imaginary sp space where you have precisely the upper trigram, if I use the Chinese lexicon, when you have the beauty, the goodness, and the truth. So I would hypothesize that in the two cases, the West and China, uh, essence, the essence of beauty, goodness, and truth are the same. But the, the imaginary projection in China is to project it in a distant past. And in the West, it is to project it in the distant future. But notwithstanding the difference in projection, uh, the essence of beauty, goodness, truth are the same. And in terms of inseparable inseparability of knowledge and action, I hypothesize that it doesn't make any difference. Why? Because either you project perfection to the past or the future, the only place where you can act to change reality is the present. So the space of imagination doesn't change that the mythology is a conceptual or symbolic tool to 
encourage you to work in the present to change things which are not satisfactory. I stop here. Thank you, Juan. Uh, does anybody else have a comment uh, about any of these? Just go ahead, come on. A comment and a question. Are we gonna try and get another uh, round of them in or are we gonna open up to a discussion at this point? I would, I don't know, Jason, what do you think? Let, let's go another three because they are very short. Okay, then okay? I'll hold my, my comments otherwise. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. So 16, 17, and 18. Yeah, so, very short. Uh, the master said, when a man is not in the habit of saying, what shall I think of this? What shall I think of this? I can indeed do nothing with him. Number 17. The master said, when a number of people are together for a whole day without their conversation turning on righteousness, and when they are found a, a fond of car carrying out the suggestions of a small, theirs is indeed a hard case. Number 18. The master said, the superior man in everything considers righteousness to be essential. He performs it according to the rules of propriety. He brings in it brings it forth in humility. He completes it with sincerity. This is indeed a superior man. Okay, the Eno translation, fifteen point sixteen. The master said, "Those who are not always saying, what shall I do? What shall I do? I can do nothing with them." Fifteen. 15.17, the master said, those who sit in a group all day enjoying clever conversation without their talk ever touching on right, such men are difficult to deal with. 15.18, the master said, the Chunzu takes right as his basic substance. He puts it into practice with Li uses compliance to enact it and faithfulness to complete it. Thank you, Kwan. We'll go to Jason. All right. 1516. The master said, for those who don't ask, what should I do? What should I do? I don't know what to do with them. 1517. The master said, those who spend a whole day socializing do not talk about proper subjects and act with petty-minded cleverness. They are difficult to deal with or to gain any achievement. 1518, the master said, a junsa takes righteousness duty as his essence, acts according to li ritual, speaks humbly and completes task worthy, trustworthily. What? Ajunsa. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Amam. So uh, 16, okay. I think all these three are quite simple. Okay, uh, chapter 16. I think uh, Confucius means if you don't ask, you never question yourself. Uh, Confucius say, I don't know what to do with that because I think Confucius meant you, he doesn't know how to teach that. So you should have a question. Uh, otherwise, there's no way to learn. So I, I, that, that's my, my, my understanding. Chapter 17, that's interesting. Confucius said, uh, those who spend the whole day socializing, qun, okay, that means the people group together uh, Confucius used this word for socializing, and I believe it's not bad words. But the bad thing is they spend whole day together socializing too much. Okay, just today we teach our kids you need to social but not socializing all day long. And then the worst thing is they all they never talk about subject 
proper, proper, proper subject, right? They're talking about gossip and they only show up their petty minded cravings. That's Confucius said. The Confucius words is nan yi zai. He used this word often, it's difficult. Okay, keep it literally means difficult, but we don't know what does Confucius mean difficult. It could mean difficult to deal or with this kind of people. Or he could mean it's difficult for them to achieve something. So uh, I don't know what Confucius means, but Confucius just said it's difficult. The master, the uh, 18, okay. So I think so here he talk about four things, right? Take the righteousness as essence. Take the uh, richer as action. And humble hum the, uh, when you speak and uh, complete your task in a trustworthy way. So that's the four things related to the one's essence, one's action, one's language, and the one's task, and you complete the task. So that's a jins. That's another definition of jins. Here I'd like to mention about the word shun, okay? And then I translate as humble. I think a couple of weeks ago we discussed does Confucius use the word humble? And I double check that Confucius used this word probably only twice about humble. And this humbleness usually uh, both both times associated with uh, the language. So uh, when it's very important, Confucius probably doesn't want, probably not talk much about acting humble, but very important is you have to speak humbly. Okay? I think control your language. I think that's in Confucius teaching. Uh, so I stop here and I'm out. I had so many windows open, I didn't know how to unmute myself. Thank you. Since we're going to open it here, I'm going to talk only briefly about these three, and then I'm going to give some overall impressions. Um, these three are just a contrast of who is worthy, who is unworthy. Um, and by worthy of what? Worthy of his teachings. That 15, 16, you know, if you're not asking, all right, I'm I'm free. What should I be doing? What should I then? I don't know what to do with you. If you just finish your task so that you can run off and go nap by the river, you're not my student. You're not the kind of student I want. I want somebody who's hungry for the next task, the next lesson, the next idea. And <laughs> and I may be projecting here um, because the next one, all I could think of was I. I don't know how to deal with these kids who text in class. They spend all day socializing and they're talking about nothing and they're just impossible. It's difficult. What's difficult? It's difficult in every regard. It's difficult to teach class. It's difficult to get a lesson through to them. They're just difficult all around. And so I think the full stop there works. Adding the parentheticals does help give some connotation or some other ideas. But I think any teacher who reads this and has spent one afternoon with kids doing that all day in a classroom can just stop with, it's difficult, and they get it. Um, and then talking about what is worthy, the Junsa takes righteousness as their duty, acts with lead, completes things, and is trustworthy that they'll complete things. These are, you know, the qualities that make for a Junsa. This is just a compare and contrast list. And it, it really tells you that Confucius was something of a taskmaster. I wanted to jump back a few degrees. I won't take a lot of time. But there was something that um, Nick had mentioned before about the solipsism of uh, the Confucian worldview. And I know there was a little pushback on that. There was a little chat in the, um, or a little back and forth in the chat about it as well. There is an absolutely prescriptive quality to Confucianism, inarguably. It is a prescription. It is a, 
a determination of how it ought to be. And he makes that argument throughout. Here we see it made again. It's the subtext to everything. Whereas what Nix was saying about, you know, the Taoists who travel into barbarian lands and probably find truth there, it's because the attempt of Taoist text is to be more descriptive than prescriptive, though obviously there are elements of both in any in any text, in any uh, proposition. But that descriptive nature allows for a mindset that travels to the barbarian lands and says, hey, show me your truth, show me your beauty. Confucianism is very solid. This is what is truth. This is what is beauty. You can travel to the barbarian lands, but you're bringing us with you and you will project that into the world around you. And if their conception of it is too far afield, your duty is to bring them back in line with the truth. And the truth is the next thing I wanted to get to. What Quan said about the idea of a utopia in the past or the future being immaterial, I disagree. It is significant where utopia lies in the minds of people because it changes the entire production of the etymological institutions. Every argument that had to be made in China for thousands of years had to be predicated on this was the tradition. This is how it was. Anytime something new was invented, it had to be, it was this way, way back when. Um, Sima Chan, the great historian's father, uh, Sima Tian, actually invented Taoism. He invented legalism. He invented schools that we now refer to as a hundred schools by casting backwards and saying, oh yeah, the guards back in the, uh, you know, er early Joe, they were the ones who had the legalistic mindset. And that's where we get this school of fa from. So it, in invention, initiation is not appreciated in a traditionalist society where that is your ontological nexus. This is different than when it's projected into the future. And that's not to say that where that nexus of ontological truth lies in the Western mindset is better. It is just differently problematic. Um, but it does not, it, it does create a difference new, novel, inventive, that can be appreciated when past is not sup supreme, when it is not the supreme thing to go backwards in time. Um, and I think that's what Nick was getting at when he was talking about the solipsism, this idea that the Middle Kingdom was the world. Everything else was ghost demons and barbarians and uncivilized lands that needed some civilizing. The result of that project is that that civilizing, that Confucianism, spread beyond the Middle Kingdom in throughout East Asia until it hit the Gobi, it hit the Himalayas, and it would have probably gone further if it could have gotten into India over the Himalayas and they hadn't been busy doing their own thing. Um, but yeah, it, it's so omnipresent in the Eastern world because it wasn't shy about being determinative of how people ought to be and where that those ideas, validity and truth rested. And it gelled with everything that was already in their belief systems. So I just want to kind of bring those to the forefront. I want to thank everybody. I've got to do some multitasking. I'll still be here, but I, I'll listen to in as long as I can. And I'll be back next week and even better rested because I'll be that much closer to the end of the quarter. Thank you, Amon. Uh, now we'll open it up for uh, comments on uh, actually these three passages or anything else this evening that you found to be of particular interest um, go ahead nick
Yeah, just a question, maybe to to Jason and Amon. Uh, for the verse sixteen, how did you translate that question? Because uh, I'm reading here the legis uh, translation. What shall I think of this? What shall I think of this? How, how did you guys translate? Uh, I I translate as uh, what should I do? What should I do? Okay, Ruzi he Ruzi. Actually, when I double check, I think probably should translate as how to do it. How to do it? You know. So uh, that that's my opinion. You know. The Chinese word Ruzi he Ruzi. That's very helpful. Yeah. Okay. So is that come any is, yeah, we will come any way. But I will take this way. Uh, of, Confucius uh, teaching uh, philosophy. Okay, if you don't question yourself, you don't think, you then uh, it will be difficult to uh, deal with this kind of people. So. Yeah. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. So, so my comment is, uh, it's very important. Uh, it's the question. This is a. Uh, he's asking. And this is a very different question. What is it? Uh, so that's that, that strikes me as the significance because uh, he's focused pragmatic on how to do things, right? For for good reason, you know, do the right thing. But nevertheless, the focus is on how. But the Greeks' interest. You know, TSD, what is this? What is the concept of this? Uh, so that obviously led to a mass of the, yeah. Thank you. Um, had a little bit of trouble you're breaking up in the end, but uh, go ahead, Guan. Okay, so. <clears throat> I want to come back to the question of the mythology and of the uh, projection of the idea in the past or in the future. Because I think here we have two different topics. First, the first topic is self-confidence. Uh, either a culture would say that this is the truth, the beauty and the goodness, and that there's not that we reach to the highest definition of what is beauty, goodness, and truth. And all the others, they are barbarians because they did not reach to that. And we define what is beauty, goodness, and truth. That is self-confidence bordering on arrogance, of course. And some cultures in the past had that self-confidence and that bordering on arrogance. And the Chinese culture was one of them. The other thing, I think that we have to distinguish uh, the source of uh, ideality of, of ideal states, not as not in chronos, okay, the, in the sense that not in the lower trigram, being that projected in the past and the future. The source of ideality or of ideal image is in the upper trigram, meaning in tampos. And that tempus is timelessness. And this is related to the self-confidence and the capacity from that self-confidence to explore reality and to, to invent the tools for exploring reality. And when those tools are invented or created or made, and the justification to introduce the tools of exploration or of power have to walk through a projection in the future and the past when depends on the mythology of the group in question. And I think that what is important is that you are capable to be in timelessness and in the upper trigram to be the source of inventivity and of creativity. Your justification a posteriori on chronos meaning we 
move closer to what was ideal to the past or we move closer to what is ideal in the future is not the mental engine at the core of the mythology allowing that creativity and that inventivity. I stop here. Well said. Does anybody else have any comments about this evening or anything that we've uh, covered or uh, specifically these last three passages? Yeah, I'd just like to say something uh, because uh, the power to the, uh, I think, I believe we will spend two, two more weeks to finish book 15, at least, at, at most three weeks to finish. So December, uh, we are going to take off for the holiday, and then uh, we are, and also take a break for the uh, uh, Confucius energy because we only have uh, five books left. Okay. We have done a lot. Uh, it's not easy, I know, uh, it's, uh, uh, for, for read, to read to read uh, Confucius energy for everybody. It's difficult, and then we are going to switch to uh, Dao De Jing, uh, which we have done that for since 2021, I think, yeah. And then uh, Amang and I feel like we need to retranslate the Tao Te Ching one more time. And then uh, beginning of January, we will start uh, doing the Tao Te Ching. And total has uh, 81 chapters, and we are going to probably do four chapters per week. And, and that, I think the time-wise will be easier to control because uh, there's no very short, very long, basic, almost the same length on each one. So it will be easy to control. So four chapter per week, and then we can finish in about 20 weeks, I think. So thank you, everyone. And then uh, I know uh, reading Analect is very difficult. And I'm glad we still have so many people interested in this uh, reading. So see you next week. Thank you. Thank as you. we've gone through this, yeah, as we've gone through this, I've actually gained a much deeper appreciation for what Confucius said in actually that time period um, as well, uh, especially the metaphysics of it. Um, I have a better understanding of that. Um, and I think that that helps me uh, at least sort through, and I, we talked to, to Quan about this also, these ideas of uh, how to even assess the actions that he's correcting uh, of the students. Uh, these are kind of practical lessons uh, in, in a way. Um, so I, th I think that I've gone to appreciate it. Uh, now we can open it up for regular, you know, just a regular, uh, just, you know, whatever any, Anybody found it to be a particular interest uh, this evening? Um, you know, I we can go a number of different ways, uh, especially if you want to talk about love and beauty, um, or virtue and beauty, uh, or uh, there was one that I found to be really profound. Was actually for me it was number fifteen. Um, you know, the master said, he, he who requires much from himself and little from others will keep from himself from being the object of resentment. And, and I think that that's absolutely true. Um, and it's profound in the sense that I think a lot of times people, um, in relationships go in with the expectation of receiving something and, they end up being resented for that reason. Uh, and so the if you go in with the idea that um, uh, where you're requiring of yourself, you know to uh, participate and actually to to uh, as a, a, a as a service, you're looking at it as how you can, complement the other individual or uh it and this is true as as it is in relationships as it is in um business as well um then 
there is a you know a whole new dynamic. Um, everything is framed around uh, what is exactly uh, what control you have over the situation. You have control to um, to basically uh, you know hold yourself to a higher standard, and you can always look at a relationship and see when what you could be doing better. Uh, but most of the relationships that I see that break down um, tend to be uh, individuals that say to themselves what they had not gotten out of it, whatever it may be. They always focus on what they should have gotten as opposed to what they could have given. And very practical uh, lesson in that I think that if we evaluate a lot of our relationships that way, that it would actually be, uh, you know, uh, extremely enlightening. Um, and, and I think that that will also relate directly. I think it was to number 16, where you're honestly questioning yourself. Um, but anybody have any comments on that? Oh, God, yeah, come on, please. I mean, uh, Quan. Oh, I'm sorry. Quan, okay. I, um, uh, I would like to, uh, for once, I would not uh, give a long theoretical consideration, but a very down to earth example. Uh, when I was uh, an intern in, uh, in my medical uh, uh, training, uh, it is well known that in the emergency room is that you have to be very careful uh, with everyone, with the other professionals or with the nurses that are working with you. Because one thing that my uh, older colleagues discover that most of the time, when a doctor get a lawsuit for man practice, it's because uh, a nurse uh, uh, having some resentment about the attitude of the doctors called the family and uh, uh, suggest uh, the family to have a lawsuit again, Dr. XYZ, okay? So it is a, uh, most of the time, the source of a lawsuit in an emergency room, at least in Montreal, I don't want to generalize too much, is a nurse harboring a resentment because of an inadequate attitude of Dr. XYZ towards him or towards her. And most of the time, it is the source of a lawsuit. So I, I just want to give a practical example that you have to be very careful of with your attitude. <laughs> In the working environment, well, uh, I, I think I think yeah, absolutely. Um, but there's you know there's a higher level, uh, um, m you know, point here is that one of the things that we've talked about is least, and well, I, I know that I don't want to come back to the idea of harmony, but I do want to come back to the idea at least uh, working collectively together um, and. Uh, you know, it is something that um, where in essentially uh, if you don't hold yourself to a higher standard, then the individuals around you are not necessarily um, going to be eager uh, to, to work with you, I would say. Um, so you have to have standards for yourself in order to and and i think when we lose those standards or start to think of ourselves as not necessarily having to act a certain way um towards others then you know that, that you can see it leads to a certain degree of disharmony um brian and penny yeah i just wanted to say on on verse um 16 or 15 i guess 15 um but, but if you kind of say the reverse to me, you immediately see where the resentment comes from. Because if you say, 
He who requires little from himself, but requires much from others, right. will be the object of resentment. Right. It's immediately clear if, if you know, you don't have to do very much or hold very high standards for yourself or but everybody who works with you has to do everything perfectly and really do a lot it's it's immediate resentment you know because it's so unfair um the the, the way you're being treated is unfair yeah absolutely uh, And it, yeah, it appears that it's kind of in a position, like you say, of some authority. Because if you're requiring a lot from others, you're in some position of, a, of authority where you're above them a little bit so that you can require it from them. That's absolutely true. And one thing it Confucius is, you know, speaks about is that the moral, the importance of moral, moral characters, uh, your, your character uh, as a leader. Um, so that's another aspect of it as well. Um, you know, the other one I, I thought to be of interest as well is number six, uh, with the sincerity and integrity. Um, when we were talking about that, uh, and we were going over, you know, that it's more, um, about authenticity, I thought, uh, as a kind of a overriding. Uh, point for this particular passage. Um, and I find that to be, um, you know, I do find that to be universal uh, in a sense, um, universally appreciated. Uh, I also find that truthfulness, whatever it may be, um, at that particular moment, I'm so to be something that is universal, uh, being universally appreciated. Um, so, you know, let, I, all these chapters this evening, where I've actually gotten to the point where uh, the idea of character, even the the one where it was, it was almost uh it was just almost out of uh i would say out of a uh stoic text was number um he says he required um uh basically you can't you can't be harmed other than if you don't act virtuously. I forget what number it was. It was, um, I thought it was 13. I oh, know that was not it. Uh, number nine, I think. Maybe it, oh, was it up that high? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that is it. Thank you. Um, the determined scholar and the man of virtue will not seek to live at the expense of injuring their virtue. And they will even sacrifice their lives to preserve their virtue complete. And I think that that's, you know, that's something that's right out of stoicism. Um, it's the idea that you can't be harmed outside of uh, you doing it to yourself, that your own personal character, when you put that at risk, that is actually what is most, um, uh, you know, most important as maintaining your moral character. Uh, and um, because that who d defines who you are, those are the, the actions that you have, and they also reflect the values that you have as well. So um, I find it, you know, some, some of, I find a lot of Confucius actually in a lot of, uh, uh, me in general. Um, does anybody have any ideas on uh, number 13, uh, which is the master said it is all over? I've not seen 
one who loves virtue as he loves beauty. I got to hear Kwan's response to that. Yeah, well, I would like to make a, because I wanted to talk about this paragraph seven, but I think that the paragraph you suggest is perfectly in, in a pair with seven. I explained myself. Uh, virtue is obviously the upper trigram. Sex is obviously the lower trigram. And when I say lower trigram, uh, I'm not looking down on the lower trigram, okay? Because we are essentially, if we are healthy, an integration of the lower trigram and of the upper trigram. Both have to be present in our life. So what is funny with uh, 13 and 7 is precisely in 15.7, in it's the upper trigram and lower trigram at the same time, okay? Su Yu, the guy who's, who is like an arrow, that's the upper trigram because uh, he stay on wave on wavering, okay. Either the state is in, either the Tao prevails in the state or the Tao does not prevail in the state. He's like an arrow. So here, the first paragraph of fifteen point seven uh, is showcasing the upper trigram, and with Chu Pao Yu, when the Tao prevails, he serves, and when the Tao does not prevail. He wouldn't hide it by his heart. So here he is street wise or street marks, smart. But Chu Po Yu also has the upper trigram. So in the first paragraph, you have a guy who has both the upper trigram and the lower trigram. But the, the description of his behavior stresses the reality of the upper trigram. He's like an arrow, okay? With the, with the Tao present in the state or the Tao absent from the state. So, but with the second paragraph with the guy named Chu Pao Yu, what is stressed is that he's, he's, he was being uh, streetwise. When the Tao is present, he would serve, but when the Tao is not present, uh, he would just resign and uh, do his, uh, and uh, does his things. So, and both men have the upper trigram, meaning virtue, and the lower trigram, let's say sex. So that's quite interesting because uh, the first paragraph uh, showcase the upper trigram and the second paragraph showcase the lower trigram. And if we go to 15.13, uh, it's the same thing. But here we have Confucius complaining a, a little bit saying that I have yet to see a man who loves virtue as much as sex. Because once again, let's not forget that the representation of the epistemological development in the Confucian school is by the three lines of the lower trigram, a space, and the three lines of the upper trigram. And that space precisely symbolizes that it is so not so easy to go to the upper trigram. Okay, that's why Confucius is complaining I have yet to see a man who loves virtue as much as sex. It is much easier to stay in the lower trigram than to make the effort to go to the upper trigram. And I would like to remind again the paragraph 14.39 because there, there are two translations of that paragraph 14.39. Either that Confucius, if you remember the Taoist said to Confucius, uh, uh, when it's deep, uh, just go through, and when it's shallow, just uplift your skirt. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Okay. So, one translation was this legit when Confucius answered, is, it's very easy for me to do that. Okay. So, his answer is, it's very easy for me to do that in the sense that uh, because the Taoist was uh, telling him, if you're not acknowledged by society, just re relinquish your ambitions and don't be so sad, okay? So Confucius said, uh, is it just so? But it's, uh, but it's not so difficult. In, uh, in the sense that Confucius said, well, it's natural for me uh, to just keep on because it's important for me to keep on exposing, the, uh, the, keep on explaining the Confucianist doctrine and the reforms that the state uh, need to implement in order to improve society, okay? So Confucius is simply saying, I'm not rel relinquishing because it's my natural 
uh, self. That's one translation, which is legit. But in my mind, the other translation is more interesting and is it has a relation to 15.7 and 15.13. When the, the Taoist said, that if it's deep, just go through, so you wouldn't get wet anyway, so just go through. And when it's shallow, you have the option to uplift your skirts, meaning you would not get weight because not, you would not get weight, wet because in this case, since it's shallow, you have the option to uplift your skirt. So option that you don't have when it's deep. Uh, so, and Confucius' answer is that just so, but it is not difficult at all. And here the interpretation can be radically different from the first translation in the sense that the Taoist is promoting a, an easygoing attitude and going with the flow, okay? So when it's deep, just go through, and when it's shallow, just uplift your skirt, meaning just go with the flow, what is possible. And Confucius' <coughs> answer is that so, but it's not difficult at all, in the sense that what you are promoting is just to stay in the lower trigram, to stay in the animal kingdom. Uh, you have no ambition at all. Uh, to uplift yourself. Once again, the space represents that there is a quantum leap, that it's not so easy to go to the other side, to the timeless dimension or to the upper trigram to use the Chinese uh, lexicon. So for Confucius, he's uh, uh, replying to the Taoist, your proposition to go to, to take things, uh, to be easygoing and to go with the flow, it's not difficult at all. I on the contrary, propose something which is much more difficult, but much more rewarding, is you want to make the effort to go to the upper trigram. And I mentioned that paragraph once again, because it has a deep relation to the master said, enough, I have yet to see a man who love virtue as much as sex, or I have yet to see a man who love the upper trigram as much as the lower trigram. You know, it's interesting in a way. Actually, every time I hear these things, I start to think of other writers and I just think of somebody like uh, even Kierkegaard, uh, who never felt like he had actually met somebody that was truly a Christian. Um, and it's this idea that the sage that we're starting to get to, um, that would, you know, that is impossible. Uh, and has there ever been a sage? Um, and that is actually a pretty important question when you're talking about the, uh, you know, the basically the metaphysics of the of, of the um, philosophy itself. Uh, so looks like is it Alessandra? Yeah, hold on just one second. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Sorry, I'm on my phone. Again. I just had a question about the word honesty, and it's probably going to have to be somebody who's a native Chinese speaker. Um, so when the word, hold on, just. Sorry, somebody was speaking to me. When the word honesty is used, um, uh, I'm assuming that they're talking about honesty in action and not necessarily honesty uh, like verbally, so saving face. I just have a question about, um, I don't know uh, what it was like in times of Confucius with regard to the concept of saving face by being polite, but could somebody explain to me with regard to honesty, sort of what they are entailing in that word? I'm not sure that I completely understand. So if anybody else has an answer. Uh, is it related to a paragraph or is it a general question? Sorry, I'm handling something in the house. Whoever is next um, can go ahead and, and take over. There's a little bit of an emergency. Okay. Um, Penny and Brian, I don't know if we want to come back to this idea that uh, we could talk about this idea of this, this sage or even moving to this upper trigram, because I, I ultimately I think 
what we're talking about is how to cultivate character and actually uh we've talked about this in the past how does how does confucius actually approach cultivating character uh in a very practical way and i think that that's what i've been taking away from the analects uh is the lessons that i'm starting to see a little bit more clearly what that is um that being said it is still a very challenging path as a as it would seem uh, brian or penny do you have any if you want to speak can you hear me you can okay i like first of all joe's initial comment on 15 and 16 i think that's definitely an excellent comment to put it more in a more positive way well the implication in a more positive no yeah to put it in a more positive way he who requires much from himself and little from others can also inspire others right uh, so it's not just avoiding complaints and the other the question i have is on seven and i really appreciated guan's discussion of that the uh, the question is the man in paragraph two uh chupu yo would you say that he's acting in a straightforward manner as was true of the person in this the first statement of chapter seven and we just lost one um so number seven um let me see here uh with a superior man indeed when good, you know, when good government prevails in his state he is to be found in office when bad government prevails he can roll his principles up and keep them in his breast uh, i would guess yes but the uh the behaviors in paragraph two are very concrete and if you will, different, not necessarily inconsistent, but different. In paragraph one, it's very metaphorical, but the behavior is the same. It's being like an arrow. Uh, so is this man in two being like an arrow when he's in office in good government? And is he like an arrow when he's keeping to himself in bad government? And um. And oh. I would say that that in uh, that particular instance, it is about consistency um, and not necessarily at let allowing um, circumstances uh, your behaviors. Yeah. That would be my answer. So essentially, that's um, yeah, that externals. You know, you're you're the same person in this situation as in as in another, and yes, that seems to be in uh, uh, what would be a man of character. And consistency re actually demonstrates a lot of things, not only character, but it also there's a certain coherency to your overall philosophy. So the different behavior in different contexts could all still be straightforward behavior uh, for sure but I want I think that what this paragraph want to stress is that uh, the guy is straightforward when the Tao prevails in the state and he's still straightforward when the Tao does not prevail in the state okay in the first in the first case when the Tao prevails in the state, being straightforward is maybe less dangerous for himself. But when the Tao does not prevail in the state, being straightforward can be a lot more dangerous for himself. Okay, but since he is a virtuous man, he will not uh, change his straightforwardness, even if it's more dangerous for him, potentially, in a state where the Tao does not prevail. Okay, thank you. One thing that I've actually been continually um, taken back by is just how much of an emphasis there is on uh, 
on rhetoric in particular. Um, and we're that, uh, so um, when we were speaking earlier about when to speak uh, and knowing the right time to speak um, and how that actually is a form of wisdom, and that's number six, I believe. Uh, so with that, um, I think that, uh, you know, that we've spoken about wisdom in the past, you know, obviously is one of these virtues, uh, and specifically wisdom that would be where you're aware of the situation and your function, um, and versus wisdom as to understanding why you're in the situation in the first place. Uh, we called it more practical or, or streetwise, so to speak. Um, how do you develop that? <laughs> Um, I think that the an the practical answer has been given in fifteen point ten. Um. Uh, well, right. Okay. I that's part of it. Um, yeah. You know that 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 is part of it. Where you're, you know, basically seeking. Uh, the advice of virtuous scholars, but um... uh, I, I would hypothesize that it's more than the advices, in the sense that you are uh, living with them in a professional context and having them as role model, because when you dwell in a state to serve those of its grandees who are worthy men befriend those of its gentlemen who are run. So uh, here, uh, it's more than seeking advice from someone because as you know, Joe, you can seek advice from someone in a very specific manner, okay? But when you are working with that person, uh, with that person as your supervisor or your director, and that you you perceive that person as a worthy man or a gentleman, that person automatically becomes a role model for you. And it's much, much deeper for me than simply seeking advice. Right. Um, and the use of role models actually is, you know, um, uh, a way of actually wrote um, because it's it's you know you're aspiring to a certain behavior that uh, that someone else is demonstrating in it, then you, know, you can even ask yourself the question you know what is praiseworthy? Uh, what is praiseworthy in another individual? What do you find to be praiseworthy? And actually, that's a reflection of yourself um, because it shows what you value. So if you find something like material um, goods to be praiseworthy, like you're impressed by that, what that individual's accomplished, that does have a reflection back on you. And so the idea of having a role model that values what would be truly good, um, then that would be... Uh, somebody that can influence you, but then also um, you could develop those values. And, and I think that that's, uh, you know, that's a much um, needed, uh, uh, needed part as far as, you know, needed um, uh, in order to cultivate virtue, I think, having good role models. So I, I agree with you on that. Um, Nick. Yeah, hi, sorry. Uh, was, uh, I was away for a bit. Did you guys uh, discuss uh, verse uh, uh, 15? We did. Oh, you did? Oh, okay, so I missed that. Uh, the answers or no go ahead if you have anything to say 
uh, sorry if I repeat, uh, but uh, this uh, short verse, uh, I find it uh, the moral teaching of this short verse uh, is very close to to John, the book of John, the teaching of Jesus that uh, you know who is uh, who is not a sinner to cast the first stone. That so I I I find this uh, this short uh, verse uh, kind of in that uh, spirit. Uh, it's a it's a pure moral teaching. Yeah. I think of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's one way you could look at it. Uh, you know, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I find that well, I see what you're saying. I'll just say that. Um, and, uh, but, we're also talking about keeping ourselves from the object of resentment as well. So that's a second half of the part that probably doesn't necessarily just talk about um, condemnation of someone else. So this is about how we act. Uh, uh, he who requires much of himself and little from others will keep himself from being the object of resentment. Um, yeah, I think this is more of a preventative than it is actually condemnation. But I see what you're saying. I do see what you're the the, the parallel between the two for what you're saying. Yeah, because from the text, it's uh, it's not very clear whether he meant to say, you know, self protection. Or he meant to say, to 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 blame on others. Uh, so, 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 yeah. So I, maybe I'm taking the second interpretation. No, I, I I think yeah. I mean, there's an element of if you require a lot of yourself, and not you're you're not going to necessarily blame others. But um, actually, could you? Go into a little bit further detail when you said for number eight, when you spoke about uh, Wittgenstein and uh, that. Number eight. Which one was it? It was eight. It was eight. Ah, okay. The Wittgenstein. <laughs> yeah. That, that's about the speaking, right? The Wittgenstein right. parallel. Yeah. So what I meant was, uh, you know, clearly he he was talking about interpersonal dialogue. Correct. Right. So it wasn't like uh, the Wittgensteinian analytical philosophy. You know how how should we parse our sentence or words uh, in order to be precise? And then if you do that, uh, being very precise, you end up uh, saying nothing. Uh, because everything is so clearly said, uh, there's no dispute arising from the dialogue. But clearly, he wasn't thinking that way. Confucius, I mean, wasn't thinking that way. But nevertheless, he was uh, he was impacting. He was communicating a similar idea, which is uh, if the context or your counterparty, you know, the stakeholder you are engaged with. Right. Yeah. could understand you or in a sense, in the Wittgensteinian sense, uh, be on the same wavelength with you, then you speak. Uh, you have a responsibility to speak. If you don't speak in that context, then, then you, you're not worthy. Right? You, 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 are, you are obliged to speak. But in other contexts where your counterparty is really not on the same wavelength with you, uh, they just, just, just go away, shut up, or well, whatever. So he was uh, saying something like that. Yeah. So obviously, the follow up question is that uh, how do you know the other guys were not listening? Right. So, so how do you define the same wavelength? 
you know, so there's all kinds of complications about communication come in. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think when you're, when, as soon as you mentioned, like, okay, the contextual nature and understanding, uh, yeah, that, that that would make sense, um, uh, the connection that you made. But also, yes, uh, the whole, I don't know, I found the whole section to be pretty interesting as far as, again, knowing what, um, you know, that that is a... Um, I, I think it also requires deep introspection, which goes back to, um, I believe, 16, which was where he was actually questioning himself or learning to question. Uh, the master said, when a man is not uh, in the habit of saying, what shall I think of this? What shall I think of this? I can indeed do nothing with him. And I think that that's an interesting point. Like if you're questioning yourself, you have this deep introspection that leads to one's ability to say, maybe like that. And that you start to ask yourself a question about what would have been the right thing to say. Um, and so you start to understand, uh, what to say, when to say it, and those come from as many experiences as possible. And as Quan said, I agree with a, also the help of a role model is very, very good um, in that circumstance. But uh, I find to be uh, also where um, it was it was uh, um, putting that together with uh, you know. Um, being able to question yourself effectively to the point where um, you're at, you have an objective view of reality so that you learn what to say um, in a particular circumstance. And that is a skill and that is wisdom. Believe me, it's, um, yes, I, I can attest to having said things that I had regret. <laughs> so... Uh, that being said, um, yeah, and probably a deeper introspection revealed that I shouldn't have said it. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, yeah, I think we've all done that, Joe. Yeah. And uh, a good friend of mine who is infamous for saying things that he shouldn't say had this idea printed on a T-shirt that says, think, edit, speak right think edit and then speak but okay i was wondering about when nick brought up wittgenstein i thought maybe you were referring to the idea that not everything can be said and i think wittgenstein says that there's sort of a limit to language beyond which we cannot go and about which we should then be silent and i'm I don't remember something like this so far in the Analex, but I was wondering if if there's an acknowledgement of the limits of language in Confucius. I would question. imagine that maybe you could find it in the Taoist passages, but I'm not sure. No, that oh, it definitely is in the Taoist passage. In fact, it's um, there are several Taoist passages passages where language distorts the concepts themselves so that we actually name things and break them apart too far yeah. so that it actually the part is becoming you know kind of uh a standalone when it's not and not to mention the opening yeah sorry right Sandra. so that it, it, the idea that you can go too far with with um in that sense but that's a little different than the idea that language is unable to capture the concepts of, you know, the full experience of reality. Yeah. And so... Um, There's the opening of the Tao, too, of that which we cannot speak. I mean, the Tao which can be told is not the eternal Tao. Yeah. The name which right. can be named is not the eternal name. Exactly. Uh -huh. No, go ahead. Go on. Well, there are three passages, and I think that one passage has more value than the other two, 
because the last two that I would mention, you have to stretch a little bit to, to go in the direction of Wittgenstein. But the first one can be interesting. Um, it was a conversation between Confucius and one of his disciples. And uh, I, I think it was Zulu, okay? So Zulu was asking how to serve the deaf. And Confucius answered, you cannot even serve the living person. How can you serve the deaf? And Zulu asked a second question, um, how can I serve the spirit? And uh, uh, Confucius answered, you cannot even serve a living man. How can you serve the spirit? Okay, so here we can understand that there are things that are beyond human understanding as one possible interpretation. Another passage is, of course, the famous 13.2 or 13.3, is the doctrine of the rectification of names, okay? So that you would use the proper name for each things. And if and it implies also that there are things that would not have a proper name because it's beyond our understanding. There is also another one, but um, let me uh, think. Uh, it eludes me for the for, for, for now, but it will come back later on. It's a great question, but Mark. It's not, yeah, but it's not as strong as the beginning of the Tao Te Ching, of course. No. Well, and it it probably wouldn't be because it's so prescriptive, right? Uh, yes, because I, I think that here it's interesting. Let's not never forget that Confucianism is an invitation to epistemological development, but at the same time, it defines very clearly the steps of that epistemological development, okay? Meaning that there is a prescription, especially in the lower trigram, one, two, and three. In the upper trigram, things uh, are opening, okay? In the sense that it is prescriptive, but there is also a space for discussion and for uh, um, contestation and for disagreement. But uh, it is clearly prescriptive uh, in, the, in the lower trigram, step one, two, and three. Okay, let's not forget one, at 15 years old, I devote myself to learning. Okay, learning what? Learning uh, what the elders have to say. Okay, learning the tradition, learning what, what has been created before you. That would be the first step of learning. But learning is also discovering by yourselves uh, to disagree what has been offered before. But this would be a higher degree of learning. At 30 years old, I take my stand in society. At 40 years old, I have, I'm no more confused, okay? So that's one, two, three, that's the logo trigram. The upper trigram is at 50, I hear the will of heaven. At 60, I hear the will of heaven without complaining. And at 70, I can do what I want without violating the universal laws. So you see that in the upper trigram, it's more open because what is heaven's will can be debated. Even mm. if they, at the first level, there is a kind of prescription what is heaven, heaven's will, but it is debatable. It, is, it can be discussed, not necessarily in, the, in an adversarial uh, meaning, but it can be open to discussion. And let's not forget that because we often talk about virtue related to actions, uh, I don't know about you guys, but for me, talking is action, okay? Uh, yes. it's, not, yeah. uh, it's not action in the sense that uh, you do something uh, with your hands or with your legs or, or professionally speaking, but talking is action. And a lot of problems that we get in life 
is because we misspoke sometimes. Very true. Yeah. Okay, because, because most of us would not steal, most of us would not murder someone, most of us would not uh, uh, be uh, involved in frauds uh, of any degree, okay? Most of us got get problem because we misspeak. Right, I agree a hundred percent on that. Um, go ahead, um, Nick. Yeah, she don't want to follow up on Mark's uh, reference to the opening sentence of Tao Te Ching. Uh, that that's very interesting. Uh, I thought that was uh, much closer to Parmenides uh, rather than Wittgenstein in the sense that, uh, you know, if there is a one, then there cannot be anything that could predicate of that one. And therefore, anything you can predicate cannot be that one. So, so that's uh, you know, it strikes me, you know, these two guys must be thinking the same thing, uh, and obviously, as Joseph said very nicely, the Wittgensteinian idea is kind of focused on different area uh, of the language, yeah, uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, so 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 that Taoism opening sentence uh, reminds me very much of Parmenides, yeah. Uh, I'll admit I'm I'm not a Wittgensteinian scholar by any stretch. All I know is word games. That's it. <laughs> so, I think Nick, you're really you're really knocking on Parmenides' door, but I'm not sure that Parmenides would have said it quite that way, because it's not that the one cannot have predicates. But when he talks about being, he does list a certain few predicates, which are true of being, which he calls the signposts, like it is one, continuous, unchanging, and so on. So, yeah, but that's an interesting triangulation between Parmenides, Confucius, and Wittgenstein. Um I mean, yeah, if I push sense. my speculation one step further, without perfectly knowing, understanding humanity, but uh, I have an image in my head that Taoism is an extreme version of humanity. Because <laughs> these guys really allows nothing to be predicted of uh, the Tao. Uh, I would like to interrupt here because... Uh... For Parmenides, he would distinguish what precisely would be called the upper trigram and the lower trigram, or timelessness and time, okay? Because when Parmenides says that only being is uh, and is unchanging, unwavering, timelessness, and one, and etc., as Mark just said, he does not exclude the lower trigram in Chinese lexicon, or he does not preclude the phenomena. But for him, the phenomena are not truly real. It's, it is only um, hallucinations because of our senses perceptions preventing us to have a direct access to that one precisely. That was our song. And, yeah, and Plato, oh, sorry, go ahead. To the analytics, I think uh, the Taoism never have a firm grasp on the Chinese thinking, right? It's interesting school of thought in the corner of the history somehow, but it never never reached the status of a Confucianism in its uh, influence of the... Can I, ask you, can I ask you as to why uh, you think it doesn't necessarily grasp? Is it that Confucius has just been imposed? Uh, or is there? A yeah, it, obviously that's a that's a deep question. But my uh, my um, sort of the elevator speech would be 
really to 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 dive into that uh, that passage we read today. I think it's uh, sixteen. You know the the, the kind of questions uh, that Confucius asked. You know, how how do I do this? Why shall I think of this? How do I do this? Very pragmatic focus on life. Uh, the question on how, rather than the great question on what. Um, so, and I think Taoism uh, kind of asking that what question. You know, what is Tao? You know, what 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 what, what is the purpose of the cosmos? What what? But a Confucius really ask the question of how. And that uh, somehow captured the, the imagination of the population through the ages. That's a very good description. Um, I guess, you know, the description between what it is, what nature is, how to live within nature. And then it's almost as if Confucianism is this how to act in uh in the world, how to act, how to um under basically I want to say understand nature so that you can act. How um uh yeah um Taoism is about the idea of understanding nature. Confucianism feels like to me is that to understand the natural order of things. You know, Confucius is very much like a Socrates, right? He he's concerned the moral behavior of human. Well, Taoism uh, very much like a pre-Socratic uh, Greek thinkers, you know, staring at stars, thinking about cosmos. Uh, you know, what is the origin of all this? You know, something that appears to be useless, you know, but actually turned out to be fundamental and uh, and give rise to science later. But uh, but the Confucius was very much like the Socrates, like hey, you know, I, you know, what should be the moral behavior of human? Right, the order. That's that is bringing order essentially. That's where it's like, what is the natural order? And they even have like yeah, kind of you know this this way of being in the world. So anyway, yeah, I, I I do think that that's the that's the distinction. But why one would have taken um, you know been more better in, in culture than the other? Yeah, in one in one place, uh, in one of the meetup, I I got a, a insight from one of the member uh, because of leisure. You know, in the Greek society, people you know had slaves, uh, you know, poverty, all that. Uh, well, they did have war, but not like uh, every every decades. Uh, so there was a lot of leisure devoted to uh, you know idle speculation of the cosmos. Um, but in, in China, especially the time of Confucius, there was a war every day, like a uh, total chaos. So, so people kind of have no leisure, no interest in in, in anything other than how to get by daily. Um, uh, I would like to push back a little bit against that argument of the war in China and not in Greece. <laughs> Uh, at the time of Plato, of Socrates, uh, uh, the Greek cities were under the pressure and the attack of the Persian Empire, and there were plenty of uh, battles out against themselves. So uh, it was as uh, uh, full of battles in ancient Greeks than in ancient China. Uh, and uh, I would say that the aristocratic Greeks having speculation about nature uh, were no different than the Chinese aristocrats of having uh, speculation about the natural order of the human order or the natural order of nature as uh, the cosmos, the physical cosmos.
Well, I think that, you know, this has been another uh, very interesting discussion. Um, uh, I very much appreciate, Nick, your input, Mark, Juan, and obviously, as well as uh, Mon and, and Jason. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that this this has um, been a pretty interesting journey. And I plan to talk to some friends about Confucius uh, that I'm going to see soon. Uh, and, you know. You can try to confuse them? What's that? You want to confuse them or you want to talk about Confucius? Sorry. <laughs> That's a good question, actually, Mark. I don't know what the goal will be, but, but it, you know, it should be aligned with virtue. So, therefore, confusing them would be, I guess, as long as I don't do it intentionally. <laughs> um, a, lot know, of people study, a lot of people study Confucianism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to thank Victor and, and DLJ and uh, Paul for, for coming. Yeah, at least if you guys showed up, it would have been nice to hear you say hello. But yeah, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, this week, we'll just really quickly, I'll just go through, through some um, uh, things that... Paul, hey, how you doing? Uh, yeah, I had a brief... I, did hear I had a brief intermittent period of resting my eyes during your meetup, so I wasn't speaking. But then I woke up and listened, and I apologize for uh, just checking out, but I had a great night listening. Thank you. Anyway, thanks for coming, Paul. Yeah, uh, no pressure. Um, so the upcoming events are essentially tomorrow. We'll be covering th the three uh, great thinkers in Walter Ong. Uh, what is it? Clifford Gertz uh, and Marshall McLuhan. That's the second time we covered Marshall McLuhan, but that should be interesting. Um, and at, uh, that's the same one. Um, and on Friday, we'll be covering uh, Shakespeare. I don't think we have anything planned for this Thursday just yet. Uh, specifically, which one of those plays? I guess it's Hamlet. So, yes. so anyway, that's, uh, that's the upcoming schedule. And so keep your eyes out, and hopefully I'll see everybody again next week. Thanks for leaving. Sure. Hey, everybody.